Hi, welcome back to this reading series. I hope you're all doing well, especially in light of the recent news that we are going into a second national lockdown here in the UK. Please look after yourselves and look after one another as best as you can, because clearly we can't rely on the government to do that. Um, and that leads me on quite nicely to the book that I'm reading today. It's called Mutual Aid by Dean Spade. It's so cute, it's like the size of my head. Um, Anyway, I think it does a really good job of explaining why we can't rely on the government to prioritise our welfare and why mutual aid projects are so important. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. Hello, this is Editing Me Speaking. I love it when YouTubers do that, so I'm glad I finally got the chance as well. Um, I just wanted to say that this is the first book in the series that is not written by a black author. Um, but I've been reading it recently and um, I really wanted to share because I think it it shares the same kind of radical vision that um, a lot of the books that I've read in this series do as well and it explicitly talks about racism um, and I found it really informative. So yeah, I hope you enjoy, I just wanted to make that clear. Okay, go back to watching the real video. In the face of increased mobilisation and resistance, as with the rebellion against racist police violence in the summer of 2020, all fearing another destabilizing disaster. Governments and the corporations they represent will sometimes grant concessions, many of which look similar to what mutual aid projects provide. In moments of deep social and economic turmoil, such as during COVID-19, governments expand income support, usually in the form of welfare benefits, unemployment benefits, or a one-time stimulus check. But government aid can also take the form of legalising squatted property, providing mobile clinics, offering meals at public schools, creating restorative justice programmes, creating resources for people being released from prison and more. Concessions like these, where the government provides something previously only offered by mutual aid groups, can be celebrated as limited victories by movements. Our organising was so strong, they had to co-opt us. These concessions might also provide vital support to many more people than mutual aid groups can reach. As with the USDA's free breakfast pro programme in schools, which fed more children than the Black Panther Party breakfast programme that prompted its expansion. However, it's crucial to remember that these concessions are necessarily limited. First, they can be shrunk or taken back whenever the moment of instability passes. This has been the historical pattern for poor relief in the United States. It gets expanded during a crisis and then contracted and stigmatised as soon as the crisis has lessened, quickly making people once again desperate and exploitable by their employers. Second, while government provisions sometimes reach more people than local mutual aid can, they usually exclude particularly vulnerable people, like people who are criminalised, working in underground economies, homeless or undocumented. The welfare and income support programmes in the United States ranging from old age and disability benefits to support for families in poverty, are consistently designed to ensure that women, people of colour and indigenous people get left out or get less. For example, the New Deal, which emerged to quiet the anti-capitalist rebellions brought on by the Great Depression and stabilise the capitalist system, was designed so that women and domestic and agricultural workers, disproportionately black and Latinx, were excluded from the benefits created. By tying many benefits to work, the New Deal also perpetuated a status quo of grinding poverty for people with disabilities. Whenever we rely on a capitalist, imperialist system to provide vital necessities, we can guess that the provisions will be fragile and inadequate, and designed to transfer far more wealth toward the populations those systems were designed to support. White people, rich people, straight people and men. Often the concessions are never delivered at all, only promised in an effort to quell resistance. One pattern that is clear in regard to concessions is that because the aim of elites is to concede as little as possible and maintain the status quo as much as possible, we get more when we demand more and build bolder, bigger pressure. It took mass movements threatening capitalist, capitalism's very existence, like those seen during the Great Depression and the 1960s uprisings against racism, just to get stigmatizing, ungenerous welfare benefits. Decades of uprisings against police brutality yielded only surface police reforms, many of which expanded police budgets and numbers. 
even unsatisfying concessions, in other words, only come with big, sustained, disruptive mobilizations. Nonprofit leaders and politicians frequently encourage pragmatism and peaceful incremental change, but the most radical imagination of what we want and the escalation of direct action to get it is what is truly pra pragmatic if we seek to win real change. Concessions won in crises, crises of sudden disaster and crises created by powerful social protest will be as strong and lasting as the mobilizations that make them necessary. Elites and their non-profit gatekeepers encourage us to make small, reasonable or winnable demands, and they try to direct our action to official channels that are non-disruptive with narratives about peaceful protest and coming to the table. They encourage reforms premised on the assumption that the systems we seek to dismantle are fundamentally fair and fixable. We have to refuse to limit our visions to the concessions they want to give. What we want is a radically different world that eliminates the systems that put our lives under their control. I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. Um, yeah. Mutual aid projects let us practice meeting our own and each other's needs based in shared commitments to dignity, care and justice. They let us practice coordinating our actions together with the belief that all of us matter and that we should all get to participate in the solutions to our problems. They let us realize that we know best how to address the crises we face. We don't need to be saved by professionals, government agents, or people elites consider experts. Mutual aid cultivates the practices and structures that move us toward our goal, a society organized by collective self-determination, self where people get a say in all parts of their lives, rather than just facing the coercive non-choice between sinking or swimming between joining a brutal and exploitative workforce, insurance scheme or housing market, or risk being left in the cold. I'm gonna stop there. I know that was quite a short extract, but I hope you got something from it anyway. Um, I really recommend you guys check out this book. You can get it from the Verso Books online shop. Um, yeah, it's a really accessible read and it's only 148 pages, so quite short. Um, it goes on to talk about the practicalities of mutual aid groups, potential pitfalls and dangers and how we can overcome them. So yeah, really important and interesting. Um, if you have any recommendations for books you want me to read next, as always, leave them in the comments below and I'm sure I'll get to them. Um, yeah, thank you for watching and I hope you have a great week. Bye!